today with our series on the Word that became flesh. And uh, we started last week with the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah, and today we're going to focus on the life of Mary. Mary was a unique woman in human history. Verse 42 says that Mary was blessed among all women. She received the only opportunity to be the mother of Jesus. Let's be honest. John's gospel has challenged us to consider what the Word made flesh and what it spiritually means to dwell in us, in our hearts. For Mary, Jesus literally dwelled in her belly for nine months. It was a unique role that only Mary was honored with. She raised him. He lived in her home and was under her care until he began his earthly ministry. Now guys, the miraculous details of Mary's role as the mother of Jesus has tempted some to worship or to pray to Mary, giving her some kind of divine status. It's important for us to celebrate today the miracle of who Mary was rather than to invent something that she was not. We actually have theological words for this. It's called Mariology or Mariodolatry, but it's the study or the worship or the idolizing of Mary to the point where the Bible never mentions it. This temptation, though, it doesn't, just doesn't happen today or in different denominations. It happened in Jesus' day as well, to be honest with you. This temptation to elevate Mary as, a, as divine even existed when Jesus walked the earth. In Luke verse, or chapter 11, verse 27, Jesus is walking, he's doing ministry, he's going from town to town, and very randomly, it was really, really random, he's walking between one town and another, and in verse 27 it says, as he, Jesus, said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. Really, really random. I would have been a little embarrassed if I was Jesus, talking about my mom's breast. And I, I, you know, last night I'm in a restaurant, and for the first time, my daughter sees someone that's that's nursing right in the in the stall next to. I mean, right there, and she's like. You know, she was like looking at like, and I'm saying that Jesus is walking around, and this woman says, blessed is the womb that bore you, the breast at which you nursed. Now, as humans, it's very easy for us to idolize God's creation above the creator. This is not new. Paul says this in Romans chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. The woman in this passage makes a dangerous leap from Mary being blessed with the role of being the mother of Jesus to somehow being worthy of the blessing that she received. Now, knowing how dangerous this kind of thinking was, Jesus responds to the woman in Luke 11. He says in verse 28, but he said, Jesus, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it, is what Jesus said. Notice what Jesus does here. He protects his mother's blessedness and protects us from idolatry at the same time. John Bloom writes the following. He says, the blessing is not in bearing the Son, but it's believing in the Son. The blessing is not caring for the Word of God made flesh, but in keeping the Word's Word. Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, correctly identifies the source of Mary's blessing. In verse 45, she says the following, and blessed is she, not who bore Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but it says, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So the miracle is not even the birth, but it's the belief that Jesus was going to do something miraculous that no one else could explain or understand. Now, some of this misunderstanding of Mary over the years from the Scriptures comes from a confusion of the word, and that word is favor. In verse 28, the angel Gabriel says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Again, in verse 30, and the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. I got a question today. Does God have favorites? Does God, play fav Does God have favorites in the world? Does he choose some people to be his favorites and others not? And if so, in which category am I? But he, does God make favorites or not? 
Doesn't seem very fair, but when you and I, when we're evaluating our blessedness or our favoredness and we see someone else that seems to have a better life or a newer car or a better relationship, we just wonder, is that, why is that person favored and me not? We make those distinctions quite often. Does God have favorites? And what is the favor of God? What in the world is that? I define favor from the Bible in this way. This is not somebody, this is, this is Pastor Mark's definition today. I define the favor in the Bible in this way. Favor is the grace of God available to all people at all times. Favor is given to us through what only God can do, and this favor of God is unmerited. You can't earn it, you can't buy it, you can only receive it. Now, favor a lot of times in the scriptures is directly connected with grace. It's almost used interchangeably at some points. So it's the grace of God available to who? All people at all times. Favor is given to us through what only God can do. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can only receive it. Now, for example, it's only by God's favor that we can experience eternal life. This favor can be seen through passages in the Bible, like Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. It says the following, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We do not deserve God's salvation. None of us in this room do. This is why we need grace. This is why Jesus came. Remember the song of the angels to the shepherds? In Luke 2, 13 and 14, it says, Suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors, or those whom his favor rests. In other words, we have peace with God, our salvation, when we receive the unmerited favor, the grace of Jesus, which is available to all. That is the favor of God. The Bible teaches us that God does not have favorites. His grace is for anyone. Acts 10, 34 says that God shows no partiality when it comes to salvation especially, but when it comes to God's kingdom purposes on earth, God clearly chooses some and not others to accomplish his work. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. In essence, God is looking for committed, surrendered hearts so that he may pour out his favor on them. To be honest, this is a second kind of favor. There are actually two kinds of favors that the Bible mentions. And because of the confusion between the two is often where we get a lot of misunderstanding in the Word of God. The second time of favor I call kingdom favor. I just made that up. Kingdom favor is the grace of God available to certain people at certain times. Kingdom favor is given to us in order to do something that only God can do. This is really, really critical here. In both situations, this grace, or this favor is unmerited. It's un- we can't earn it or buy it. In one sense, it's available to everyone. God's salvation, he shows no partiality. Over and over in the scriptures we see that. But this type of favor, this type of kingdom favor, God places on certain people in order to accomplish things that only God can do. And so when you pray for a car, but you only want it for yourself, or you pray for some material blessing or something else, but it's only for you, it, can, it directly contradicts the fact that God wants to bless you in order to accomplish his purposes and maybe not your own. Kingdom favor is the grace of God available to certain people certain times. It's given to us in order to do something that only God can do. And the next one is kingdom favor, once again, is unmerited, but it's accessible through obedience, faithfulness, humility, and other godly acts and attitudes. And to be honest, we we see this. We can identify several people in the Bible that accessed kingdom-type favor. The first guy that you see in the Bible is Abraham. He found favor with God through a deep friendship. He was called the friend of God, and he was blessed by God in part through his friendship with him. 
Joseph in the Old Testament found favor with God through an unwavering obedience. Time and time again, he was disappointed by life with his brothers in Egypt, in jail, with Potiphar's wife, so many things, yet he had an unwavering obedience, and because of that, he found favor with God. David found favor with God through a heart that sought to do his will. He was called the man after God's own heart. He accessed the favor of God, the special favor of God, to do God's will and serve God's purposes through this heart to do his will. Solomon found God's favor through what? Wisdom. He prayed for wisdom above riches, above all. He prayed for wisdom, and through that wisdom, he was able to accomplish the purposes of God by the favor of God. Mary, in this passage of Scripture, finds kingdom favor with God through humility. Not because she has some divine womb, not because she's some supernatural person. She finds the favor of God. It's accessed through her humility. Humility draws the favor of God and opens the door for God to work. It's a central theme of her song, verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies myself. No, no, no. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. She understands that her humility has brought this incredible blessing. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Her kingdom favor was accessed through her humble estate. Even in their old age, we witnessed last week, God's kingdom favor on Zechariah and Elizabeth, through their obedience, they were called righteous, they walked blamelessly before God. Now, at the beginning of her life, Mary is favored through her humility. God's plans and purposes have nothing to do with our age, our background, or our abilities. Now, with this in mind, what can we learn from Mary's story that we can apply to our own lives? How can we adjust our lives to experience more of Christ at Christmas? That's a question that we've been asking each week now. And I've got five suggestions for you today, practical ones that I'm going to share with you right now. The first one is, Switch the price tags. Switch the price tags in your life when you feel like God is calling you to something, when there's a new vision for what God is asking you to do or to be in this world. My first suggestion for you today is to switch the price tags. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, John 10.10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And if you've given your life to Jesus, if you've given your heart to God, He is the owner of your life. He Your life, your house, your heart, everything belongs to him. Satan cannot steal, kill, or destroy who you are once you are in Christ. But Satan can come in and switch your price tags. Switch what you value. Many of us in this room are tempted to value or or take on the value of who we are based on what we earn or based on our grades or based on our accomplishments rather than God. Some of us in this room, to be honest, we're more concerned about what people think of us on social media than we are what God thinks about us. What's happened? He switched the price tags. We still belong to God. God still loves you. He still cares for you. He still has a plan for you. But we've altered or rearranged the values in our life in order to destroy the purposes that God has for us. Now, when I look at this passage of Scripture, in one sense, the Christmas story is the gospel of nobodies. I mean, it really is. I mean, we know these people now that we've heard the Christmas story so many times. They're famous to us. When we talk about the three wise men and the shepherds, everything looks so glorious. But all these guys were pretty much nobodies in their own day. Verse 26 and 27 says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth, a great city, right? To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. There is nobody written over all those two verses. I mean, nobody's vacation destination was Galilee. Most of us, when we think of Galilee, we think of Sermon on the Mount, these beautiful mountains, Jesus doing all this stuff. Nobody would go to Galilee during this this time. And remember when Jesus, when he was first starting his ministry, and they said, hey, where's that guy from? And they said, he's from Nazareth. What did they say? Man, what an amazing city. No. They said, can anything good come from Nazareth? 
comes from nowhere. We got a teenage virgin named Mary and Joseph. Nobody knows. Let me just ask you a question. Have you ever felt like your life is too small for God to notice? Like God notices and does things for everybody else for, but for you? Do you feel like sometimes you're just, your life is just too small? Let me just say one small thing here. I'm going to go off book for a minute, but I want you to notice the importance of women in the Christmas story for just a minute. Um, I would love to say that in our modern world, that life is an equal playing field and that men and women are treated equally and that everything is, is just a level playing field across the board. But we know that's not right. We know that's not true. Most of the women in this room that are listening to us on Facebook right now, you have to work twice as hard for half the money, right? There are so many inequalities that go on. Sometimes it's easy to believe that God just doesn't care about you. What's interesting to me is all throughout the Christmas story, which was very rare in the days of the Bible, Elizabeth had a huge role in the birth of John. Not just because she, she gave birth to John the Baptist, but it is her testimony and her action with Mary. Mary is blessed among all women because of her humility and because of what's going on. Later on, Jesus' Messiahship is confirmed by a prophet woman named Anna. All women, very rare at this time to see this in the Bible. Once again, her humility, Mary, is favored by God. Elizabeth is spiritually and supernaturally confirms what's happening to Mary. You know, most of us, when we think about who first confessed that Jesus is Lord in the Bible, most of us think it was Peter. But to be honest, it was really Elizabeth. If you remember the story, Mary comes in to visit her. And what does Elizabeth say to her? Verse 43, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me, Elizabeth is the one that confesses that Jesus is Lord first, even before Peter. You're more important to God than you know. <laughs> Number two, maintain your personal integrity. When God gives you a vision for your future, for what your life ought to be like, for where, what's happening, maintain your personal integrity along the way. Verse 30 through 33 says, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. What is interesting in this passage is how detailed the angel is about what will happen to Mary. Mary has been noticed by God, not by some great accomplishment, but because, once again because of her humility and integrity. Now, she's already been faithful with what God has given her. And honestly, that's a real definition of integrity. In business circles and in academic circles, we often define integrity as who you are when no one else is looking. Most of you have heard that definition of integrity. I think true spiritual integrity is who you are when only God is looking. Who are you when only God can see you? Let me just say one thing today about sexual integrity. Mary doesn't receive this favor without her virginity. Can we just be honest today? The virgin birth doesn't happen without the virgin, right? And so beyond all these things, and maybe, maybe you know God maybe has a plan for you in the future, but you're asking yourself, what do I do right here and right now? And for some of you, especially for our younger ones in the audience today, maybe you just need to maintain your sexual integrity. Mary's virginity reveals her faithfulness to God's plan even before she knows it. You realize that? She has been given that. She guards that. And because of that, it opens the door for greater opportunities. Mary is more prepared than she realizes for the birth of the Christ child. You may not be chosen to be the mother of Jesus. That won't happen again. But your sexual integrity and fidelity is important in the eyes of God. For those of us in this room who are married, let me just say to you, your sexual integrity is still important. The choices that you make about your, your sexual life and I'm not just talking about having multiple partners. I'm talking about the jokes that we make or the things that we consume or how we treat those around us. Maintaining your sexual integrity opens great doors for God to bless you 
and for you to see clearly his path for your life. Maintain your personal integrity. Number three, ask God for next steps. Verse 34 says, And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? Now Mary's response to the angel's message is different from Zechariah last week. In verse 18, it says, And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? Or really it says, How can I be sure of this? In his unbelief, Zechariah asked, How can he be sure that God is going to accomplish this? Mary doesn't ask the question if God can do it. Her question is, God, how are you going to do it? She wants details and next steps. Her question comes out of her faith and not her unbelief. And when, in, when the details are unclear, I want you to remember this, and please listen. God is often more concerned on the person you will become than the place where you're going. God is more concerned with your character and your integrity than figuring out what's the destination here, here, and here. Some of us don't even know what God is going to do next week, much less next year or in the next five or ten. But I know God right now is concerned with who you are and the person that you're becoming. Mary may have a lot of questions on how everything is going to happen, but she does understand who she is. Once again, verse 38, and Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. To be honest, I think verse 38 is one of the most miraculous places in the entire Christmas story. More miraculous than the virgin birth or the stable and the animals and the star. Mary, this insignificant teenage girl, believes and says, may it be according to your word. Fourth one before we go. Pursue relationships with others that will support God's vision for your life. If you have an issue with drugs and alcohol, the last thing you want to do is to hook up with your drinking buddies on a regular basis, right? You get a new vision for your life and what God wants you to do. You can't hang with the same people. You have to begin to look around you and to gain new relationships journey that God is calling you on now. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to drop everyone else, but it does mean that you have to add something new. You have to make room for a new relationship for the new journey that God is calling you on. Pursue relationships with others that support God's vision for your life. We often choose friends based on how they make us feel or how much they agree with our thinking, right? Most of us surround ourselves with yes men and yes women for the majority of it. And it's very, very difficult to be around someone that will tell us the truth even when we don't want to hear it, right? Or that will really direct us in a place where we need to go. Mary goes to great lengths to find someone who would support God's vision, no matter how crazy it sounded. Verse 39 says that Mary went in haste to see her cousin Elizabeth. In haste. She is on a mission. She's got to get out of town. She's got to get out quick. Why in the world does she want to go talk to Elizabeth? Because Elizabeth understands the vision and what God has placed before Mary. She's perhaps the only person at this time that will really understand. I don't know how close Elizabeth and Mary were as cousins before, but now they are sisters on a different level. When God changes your plans, look for new traveling partners. Open yourself up to new friendships in new seasons. Look for those who will challenge you and not just tickle your ears. Last one. Let God give you a new song. As you begin to see a new vision for this word made flesh that wants to dwell in your heart, that wants to give you a new vision for your life and your purpose, let God give you a new song. When God changes your life, find your voice in his plan. You know, any time that, uh, that God has given me the opportunity to share Christ with someone and they receive Christ as their Savior, almost always I will typically tell them once they've, once they've received Jesus, man, go tell somebody. Go tell somebody. Why? Because when you voice it, something new happens. You begin to believe. You begin to put your money where your mouth is. You put it out there. I'm going to believe this. I've done this. I'm going to let everybody know. It's just like a diet. If you don't tell anybody what your plans are, there's a greater chance you will never complete that. The more people you tell, 
And then you see them and, the, and you go, oh, yeah, I've got that cookie or that donut in my hand. And guys, this doesn't mean you have to sing for those who don't sing very well, but you do have to share. The more you voice what God is doing in your heart and life, the less overwhelmed you're going to feel as well. If I were Mary, I'd be worried about my life, about Joseph, about the pregnancy, about my reputation. She's too busy magnifying God. She's too busy giving voice to what God has told her rather than worrying about all the details. In the face of a million uncertainties and details, she can't get past the greatness of God. And as we close today, I want you to listen to Mary's song and ask God to give a voice to something new in your heart.